Um, Laura Matiazzi from NAB Agribusiness. Thanks for the opportunity to ask the questions. And, and um, I, um, I don't have a particular question to, to anyone, but just to the mm. panel. I want to talk about uh, our largest trading partner, and that is China. So 34% of our trade, all trade, gone to China. Uh, in fact, our largest agriculture commodity trading partner is China too. Mm. Now, just on the note that um, there's quite a few panel members mentioned about investment. Um, the, the controversial sale of Eat VDL lately, the largest dairy farm in Australia, to, to Moon Lake investment with the Chinese investments has, has stirred quite a bit of controversy in, uh, in, the, in the public domain. Mm. So my question is around talking about China market. Dairy in terms of Australian dairy industry to China is fairly new, um, late comer. We've got European players, we've got Americans, we've got Kiwi, they, they've taken over uh, that market. 50% of the top uh, top players in, in China, in fact, are foreign-owned. So this foreign investment, they either married into a, a large dairy company in China or they, um, uh, they be form part of a supply chain. So either they attracted their investment from Chinese to their own country through processing or, or supply chain, or they went to China to invest up the supply chain. So my question is to the panel is how do we as an industry can leverage on the investment either coming out of China or going to China to form that, re to form that relationship, the trading relationship, to a more strategic and long-term sustainable relationship. Mm. Gentlemen, who'd like to tackle that? It's a fairly broad question, so there could be quite a few answers, I suspect. Um, Barry, you look like you want to. So, um, so I think inevitably the way, the, the, the way you encourage investment or have confidence to invest is to actually begin with a relationship. So you do in fact begin with a trading relationship which then ideally uh, grows to something else. And, and, and I think it is perhaps fair to say that the speed at which uh, China has grown and indeed the position that the Australian dairy industry found itself in over that particular decade of growth has seen that we, I think it is fair to say, we, 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 we were behind the eight ball, not in a position to be able to take up the opportunity. Um, I don't think that's an opportunity lost. I think there is, and, and what we're absolutely seeing now is that while uh, the first wave of investment was international companies going into China and looking to invest and looking to find partners in China. We're now seeing the second wave, which is around the world, so not, certainly not unique to Australia. Uh, you can see the likes of Bright Foods, uh, you, know, strong, you know, with strong presence in, um, in, uh, in New Zealand. You see uh, actually an infant formula uh, customer of ours with, uh, with infrastructure owned in Holland. So that second, which, that second wave is also happening. So I think we, we in some cases don't have the structures and, and haven't been investment ready in Australia. I think that's quickly changing, but I think people need to think about how they get investment ready. Uh, and I, and you know, from an Australian perspective, it is a question of having confidence in your partner. And I think the, the, that is absolutely understanding that you've got mutual objectives that align well. Um, that, that confidence has probably been a little slow to arrive, but I think it's definitely there now. Greg, did you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, I think it's a really good point because it's something that we struggle in our business with. Not struggle, but we talk about a lot. Um, and I suppose my reflection is I think the mining boom has had a carryover on how we actually, and how China and Australia interacted. The mining boom, um, there was plenty of Asian investment in, in the mining sector. Uh, the mining sector came off the, off the boil. People were looking to place money, looking for the new wave of agriculture. Our government was looking to encourage um, the agriculture sector to take a greater opportunity into Asia. And so there was this great, in my view, a great collision about how do we do all this? And it was actually had, had to happen all really quickly. And you know, I don't know what uh, others were like, but my phone used to ring. It wouldn't be un unusual to get two or three calls a day. I had no concept of who the people were, how, how to deal with them. And I think, and, we, and of course we dealt with them in an appropriate way. And, and as Barry uh, made, made um, quite aptly was that we need to be polite about um, how we respond to people. But I think we're actually, I think there's been great learnings in the last 12 to 18 months, and I think it's um, going back and reflecting and, and building those relationships and allowing those relationships to take the time to become larger and larger in our businesses and, and both parties recognising that this, will, this is an evolution of relationships and it will change. So I think, I think if we all take a step back from time to time and actually look at it, and I think now's a perfect time to actually take the next step and perhaps p create that step change where and what I was suggesting in my presentation is that not necessarily taking Australia to Asia, 
but, we are, but us as processors and manufacturers thinking about how the Asians actually tap on our door and ask for the products that they want, not we tap on their door and, uh, and give them the products that we make. Mm. So I think there's a, a, an evolution in that process. And Tassos, just very briefly, I was dying to ask you after hearing your reflections about um, quotas in the EC, is there, is there a real prospect that that wheel could turn again and that quotas could be reintroduced? I, I, don't, uh, I don't believe so. First of all, our decision-making process is pretty complex. So it will take three or four years by the time prices will be up. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, second, because I think uh, <clears throat> deep inside uh, people understand and realize that this was not a, a solution. I mean, if, uh, I, it is interesting that one of the farmers that is leading all the criticism about what is happening right now in dairy markets, I remember him some years ago complaining about all the costs for a young farmer to invest in dairy because of the quota system. So I don't think this... Uh, uh, this will happen. Uh, also, we had a lot of uh, ideas and pressure, and I heard some not so nice compliments in the European Parliament last week in a meeting of its Committee on Agriculture about why we resist ideas of doing what the Americans are doing, counter-cyclical support and the rest. Uh, if you see the evolution of the US income, which is much more volatile than the EU income, then you realize that you know, having a fixed layer of support more or less helps more farmers. But what we're going to face, and that's the difficulty, is that we're dealing with a situation now of 28 member states, and even in these 28 member states, you have regional differences within the member states, some of them. And we will face uh, more pressure uh, stemming from climate change. Uh, us and the New Zealand are the only two parties in the uh, Paris Agreement that have put quantitative uh, uh, targets for uh, agriculture. And that will uh, generate uh, some adjustment process, which, as we have seen in previous reforms, is not going to be uh, necessarily smooth in the beginning. It will take a couple of years. Uh, another reason why we're not going to have any supply control is because there is a side e effect on, in the beef sector in, in the EU, which is greater than other parts of the world. So to make a long story short, I believe at the end of the day we're not going to do supply controls, we're going to do supply adjustment. It's not going to be, uh, it's not easy already, uh, and we do expect that unless other nasty surprises uh, await us, uh, some relief will come after the summer. Uh, I think everybody is hoping for this. Okay. Our speakers this afternoon, Peter Collins, Tassos Haniotis, Greg McNamara and Barry Irvine, could you please thank them?